What's up, everyone? Welcome to the Major Mixtape Podcast. I'm your host, Jason. Hope you're doing well whenever and wherever you are watching this. Special treat for you guys today because joining the show to talk about her new single, Stay With Me, and her all of her music in general, Christina Martin is in the hot seat. Christina, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm great. I love your podcast voice. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. So let's talk about Stay With Me. Uh, we've got new music now. Now, this is pretty much the first new music that's come out since the pandemic started. Am I correct? Mm, yeah, pretty much. I think we put out, I put out two live albums, but it wasn't new music. It was, you know, old stuff from the vault. <laughs> <laughs> so having that out now and you know getting ready to you know to do a maritime tour in november how good does it feel to kind of get back into the flow of things ah it's a bit of torture uh, and a bit of bliss to be honest i mean i you know uh, i mean i wish i could just be writing all day and making music and getting better at that but um, I, I'm spending an inordinate amount of time, you know, on the business stuff and just trying to keep things going, which is, I don't mean this as a complaint. It's just a fact that things are harder and take longer than before the pandemic. Um, and there's still so much uncertainty. So, um, yeah, it's great. It feels good to finally be releasing stuff that we've worked so hard for, um, to make with friends and other, uh, super talented creators and musicians and, uh, that's great. And I, I'm love being able to perform it, but, um, yeah, there's just the torturous side of, um, promoting your music and this is fun though. This is today's <laughs> fun. I can tell, I mean, like, <laughs> you know, uh, so don't, don't get me wrong, Jason, but yeah, it's, um, it's still a slog, you know, in a way. Now, 2019 beautiful lie comes yeah. out. You guys were on tour and then everything kind of shut down kind of halting the album cycle. So when right. everyone, when everything stopped, how much of a shock to the system was that? Because up until that point, you had been putting out music fairly consistency almost every two to three years. Yeah, right. Uh, well, I mean, oh yeah, Wonderful Lie uh, came out, yeah, 2019, and we were touring across Canada and we were in Europe when uh, we had to stop in the middle of a tour um, and come home. I mean... Uh, how much of a shock it, it was it was a shock to everybody who you know whose livelihood was 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 threatened um and uh luckily we're very fortunate to be you know in a canadian in the sense that you know the government acted pretty fast to um you know help get, provide some kind of relief for um uh, artists in my position uh had to stay home. They could not get on the road. Couldn't, couldn't earn revenue the same way. But, um, I mean, I'm the kind of, I've always been quick to, um, you know, like think, what can we do? I mean, of course the last few years I've learned so much other skill, so many other skills, including like some video editing and, and, um, engineering. And I set up my own studio. And so I've, I've become better in a lot of ways that, um, you know, co-producing, working on my records and my music. Um, so that, you know, there's, there's certainly the silver linings to it all. Um, but it's, it's still been hard, you know, uh, to get back to touring the way we did. I mean, that was, it was, it was just, we were, we were just starting to feel like we were getting in our groove and, and starting to, you know, um, kind of be able to earn enough revenue to keep things going. So, um, it's been, you know, it's been <laughs> ups and downs and I don't think we're in the clear yet, but we're I'm just trying to stay healthy and positive and as much as I can and, you know, keep doing, keep trying. Like, I mean, I think a lot of people have had to stop and, and, um, and do other things and, and that can be really heartbreaking. There's a quote from you from, there was a, a behind the scenes video. From, oh. the, from the live at the marquee what? video and there's a line in there where you said when we're singing and playing that's a safe space as we're getting ready for as you're getting ready for that tour in november getting into the maritimes how mm -hmm. much is that safe space going to be almost cathartic for you Ooh, um glad you reminded me of the thing i said once that i didn't remember uh <laughs> 
The Wonder of Video. I love singing. I <laughs> I love singing. I love singing. Um, you know, when I'm prepared, <laughs> when I'm rehearsed, and I know my songs, I love it because it, it's. Um, you know, when even when I was really young and I sang like you know it, by myself uh, with my door closed, um, I think it was. I think that was where how I when I breathe. I think that's when I I really know like I'm actually breathing and I'm not, you know. Um, kind of holding it in or, or I'm not thinking about anything else. I'm really uh, in the moment. And I think I'm, you know, it's something that I'm good at now. I, I was, I, I'm, <laughs> I always have lots to learn and I can get better at singing, but I just really enjoy it. And uh, yeah. So I think anytime you're doing anything where you're breathing and your focus is on like the breath and really kind of, um, you know, letting, letting go and, and, um, you know, expressing, I suppose, like is certainly cathartic and healthy and, um, you know, it's not my ongoing, I guess, state. Oftentimes I'm like anxious and worried and, um, <laughs> thinking how, you know, about meeting deadlines and, uh, you know, the, the curse of the music business side of things when you're an artist, I suppose I shouldn't call it a curse, but that's how it feels sometimes. Um, yeah, so I, it'll be great. I, I mean, I love singing my my newer music um, more than I do, you know, my like earlier songs. And every time I write a new record, I'm even more excited to to perform those um, songs for people because I think I, as I get older, and this is what I this is what I've dedicated my life to. Um, I think you you become more, uh, you, you hopefully strengthen what you do and, and you, you become more you, or I don't know that I may, may I may probably not saying that right, but, um, I just love it so much. I love singing and yeah. And then I'm with my, my best friend is my guitar player. My, he's also, I'm also married to him, but, um, so, you know, it's like something we really enjoy doing together and, and, uh, that we're good at and, so that feels good to finally be doing that thing that you've been sitting at home for years now planning to get back to. It's like, oh, finally, holy geez, you know, like I never thought, I didn't think we'd be able to do this again in this way. <laughs> yeah, it's, and it's great to see people and hear them and like, um, it's a give and take, right? It's not like just all me like putting myself out there. Like I feel like I'm getting a lot from the people that come to the shows and I really enjoy, I mean, I'm a very much a person who needs a lot of alone time, but I also like within, you know, a two hour time frame, like I, I really get a lot from seeing people and being, and being social. And, and uh, so that, that really satisfies that side of, of me that like needs my, um, yeah, my my public fix, I suppose. Now, you also announced recently that you have been invited back to Dachau for the mm -hmm. artist in residence program. So, first of all, what is the artist uh, uh, the artist residency in Dachau all about, and how good does it feel to be invited back for the first time since I think it was twenty thirteen to twenty fifteen? Oh well, feel, that's really wonderful. I mean, I mean, it's like kind of like a coming home because we've spent so much time there and. Um, we have real, we have friendships there. Um, we love the community. So the city of Dachau, you know, uh, before World War II was known as an artist town. And, and I mean, some, I think it was one of the first places in Germany anyway, that women could go and study art, visual art. And, um, so it has a history with a lot of painters coming to the community. And of, of course, since World War II, um, it was the home, the first, one of the first, of uh, uh camps that trained SS soldiers. And, and then of course, um, because of uh, the history with the connection with World War II and the camps, um, you know, it ha it became known for this uh, uh, concentration camp. And so it's, which is still there as a, as a learning uh, place, a center and a memorial. And I think the artist residency was, uh, is part of the initiative of the community to, um, build international friendships. Uh, my friend Kai, who's the deputy mayor of Dachau, I remember he told me once, he just said, you know, international friendships prevent war. And um, 
So they really have all a lot of these kind of p- partnerships with different towns and Euro- around Europe, and they bring in artists from around the world to um, um, kind of revive this. Or also, the history of the artists, uh, you know, coming to Dachau, and I mean, art um, is obviously very important, <laughs> integral to our lives and to communities, and and um, to invite international, you know. Uh, uh, artist is is uh, is always a great idea too, um, uh, because you're getting a sense of what's happening in the rest of the world through the art that they're bringing through the music, and um, so that's what they're all about. They're all about like you know taking making opportunities to make international friendships, and um, so it's uh, I, for, I digress. Maybe maybe I, maybe I don't digress, but. It's, it means a lot to us because I, you know, it provides us with a, a home base and I've built um, my team, my promotional team in Europe and and, lo- and lots of fans from having a place to stay on our days off. So we'll go for the 90 day period that you can go and work uh, without a visa in Europe and um, have days to rest. And certainly, you know, uh, now that just the state of everything, I feel safer having a place if, if tour dates are canceled for whatever reason, if we got sick, which is always a concern on tour, we have a place that we can be and rest and, you know, that it won't cost us more money because right now we're obviously we need to make money. Um, <laughs> we don't have any <laughs> relief anymore. We need to get back to work. And, and so, um, you know, another pandemic shutting down a whole tour, um, you know, is quite quite uh, significant and serious and concerning. So I'm I'm excited to see friends and and to also gives me a chance to um, build new partnerships and work on projects that we're working on here, but take them over there and uh, workshop them with partners over there. And it's all about building new relationships and connecting with more people. So it's really exciting. When you get to those new creations, when it comes to writing new material or just, you know, exploring different sounds as far as the songwriting process goes, you know, how much does, you know, a a residency in a place like Dachau actually change uh, your usual writing process? Well, it it doesn't change mine in the sense, like I've never gone somewhere to just to write. Um, My, it's usually for me tied to I'm touring I'm um, working, I want to do a music video there. So we, for me, um, my life isn't just about songwriting. And my songwriting process is pretty much always the same. When I make time for it, um, it's really just sit down, write, and get your hands on a guitar or keyboard and things start flowing. And it's just a matter of making time for it. And, um, you know, like devoting a three month period or three weeks to, okay, I'm going to write as many songs as I can. I've, I've never done that in Dachau. It's always been on my days off. I'm either resting or I'm working on, you know, my promotional projects, um, but lots of touring and booking shows and, and working on the next tour while you're on that tour. So, I mean, I know artists go and I have, a, you know, it's much, it must be luxurious to go and just write, um, but that hasn't been my... Um, my situation so i'll be going and like working with other musicians on some of the new songs like perhaps um we'll be working on uh maybe with some string players uh so that when we go back in the next year with the, when the album's out we'll be hopefully playing with some string players on a few shows i'm working on some accessibility initiatives how to make my shows online and in person uh how to reduce accessibility barriers um and be more inclusive so We'll tr- I'll try to network with people on the ground for some of my shows there and see how we can build on that for the future in Germany with, you know, German partners. So um, those are the kinds of things I'm working on. I probably won't be writing a lot of songs. I might be journaling, like that's part of my normal routine, uh, but I get up in the morning, you know, exercise, journal, um, but yeah, I probably won't have a lot of news. Who's to say, Jason, like a song sometimes just drop in your lap. Right. So, I mean, I could be honestly journaling and listening to a song while I'm running that morning and it could inspire something. And then I write that idea down or sing it into my phone or whatever, and then take it back home to Canada and finish it while I'm here. Cause really like where we live in the countryside is the best place for me to finish music. 
um, it's quiet. There's no distractions except for my inbox. And I'm usually, I usually complete songs when I'm here at home. You mentioned about, you know, accessibility to, to live music. And of course, you know, over the last year and a half, you know, live streams seem to be some of the only, uh, you know, availability to live music that a lot of people had. As that developed over the past year and a half, and I know you did some live streams yourself, do you think that finding ways to make concerts available for people, you know, who aren't comfortable going to a, a, a live music venue, who aren't comfortable being part of a crowd, do you think that's going to be kind of the way for concerts and venues as a way of at least expanding the reach of a person's live performance? I think more, more venues are starting to consider that. Um, And I think it's hard for artists that maybe, um, you know, don't live with a disability, um, don't live with like a social phobia, anxiety, or sensory issue or concern. Um, to think about, you know, unless it's brought to your attention, like these things have been brought to my attention by my fans. You know, I couldn't get into your show because no, oh, nobody was there to open the door for me. Or like, um, you know, I've had people come up and say, I don't come out very often because I live with this severe anxiety. Um, and you know, it's not comfortable for me to be around a, a large crowd. So sometimes people prefer coming to like a house concert or whatnot. Um, so I think, I think the conversations are definitely, I'm starting to hear, you know, more and more that people want to find out what can I do? Um, you know, I, uh, I think, I think that there needs to be, uh, because the, one of the concerns is, well, some of the, some of the things that we can do uh, are, you know, cost too much, or I think there are things we can do to um, remedy that and, and kind of reduce the financial barriers or just the way we think about, um, you know, creating safe spaces for everybody to feel welcome and comfortable. I mean, it's really hard to make an event uh, amazing for everybody, you know, and, and certainly not everyone's going to want to come see certain kinds of music um, too. You can't expect like uh, that. So I think the point is just like, at least for myself, it's like, let's, I want to try. I want to try to learn as much as I can. I mean, I just learned, you know, this week, I just got closed captioning done by a company for my new uh, videos. And it's something I want to get into the practice of doing. I've never done that before. Um, for the online event where, where I'm hosting on the 24th, I'm working with a, a partner uh, who's going to be doing a Zoom meeting alongside ours. Uh, our event with an audio described ver- version of my video and that video will be public as well on the 25th. Um, so like these little th- big things that I just, I didn't know how to do. And I think a lot of people don't know how a lot of musicians don't know how to, to provide these services or um, so yeah, it's, it's a hot topic, I think. And it's really interesting. Um, but I mean, I think everybody, if given the chance, uh, and maybe a playbook would be interested to to make their music more available to more people, you know? A lot of what you've talked about so far um, has been... Is bull. You know, is bull. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's just no, no. super <laughs> but, boring. But, yeah. but is, 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 you know, mm. very considerate of people's, you know, needs and the barriers that they have as far, when it comes to music. Um, you know, as well, you, you've had a lot of, you know, mental health initi- initiatives with your career so far, as far as um, using the one tour to, to help with CAMH, with the, your residency at uh, Dalhousie Geriatric Medical Research and with the Canadian Dementia Knowledge uh, Translation Network. I just want to make sure I got the, the names right there. You, know, you did. Yeah, I would have <laughs> forgotten. You're good. <laughs> You're doing good. But, you know, when, when you take a look at all of these, you know, initiatives and things that you have done with your career, there is a lot of consideration for people with with disabilities, for people who are going through tough times, with people who are able to use music as, you know, a, a, a healing and assistance tool. Where does that drive come from with you to want to help people, not just as a songwriter, but by using your career in order to be able to further those uh, those advances? Well, I mean, I guess going back to what I said earlier, like, I mean, I've, I've had friends or fans that have brought it to my attention that, 
you know, this is something I should consider. Um, you know, I also, my, my, my brother, uh, Stefan, you know, lived with severe anxiety and, um, I remember, you know, always wanting him to come to my shows in Toronto and, and sometimes he would and, uh, but he lived with, um, some, you know, some pretty hard issues and, so it was kind of always on my mind, but you know, that was a, definitely a strong connection uh, reason to get involved with Cam H. But I mean, that was also an opportunity that was presented to me that I feel like was mutually beneficial. And as, as all the partnerships you mentioned, um, but uh, when I, when I was younger, I, I, I went to a volunteer fair and, you know, discovered uh, the Canadian Mental Health Association and Halifax Dartmouth branch, shout out. Um, and so became a volunteer and, and developed friendships through that program. I learned so much, so much about myself. I was studying psychology at the time. Um, you know, I did respite work. I worked with um, young adults and adults that live with disabilities. Um, I had a roommate who was a special ed teacher in Texas when I lived in Austin and you know, she hooked me up with all kinds of great people and I had these jobs on, on the side. And so I, I really, I just love, you know, the work. And, and, and so I was, I was help, help making sure that like when I was working with, with people and trying to get them out to events, I was always looking for like, um, you know, what can we do? What music can we go see? And then had to consider, is this, is this going to be safe and, and good for my client? And so I think, now that you've made me think about it, I think just my experience with work um, and meeting people and having friends living with disabilities, you know, and, and I mean, I've had my own um, struggles with like social anxieties, particularly when I was younger. Um, so it just makes you kind of more in tune and conscientious than you think about these things, because right? it was so it was such an integral part of my work and and my studies at university. And um, so it makes sense that it became something I was wanting to be more conscientious of in my, uh, you know, now. Um, but I really think the thing that pushed me in the recent years, like I'd say in the last four years, was when. Um, I had a friend who bought a ticket to see a show in Toronto and the venue said, that it was, you know, said that they were um, accessible, wheelchair accessible. Uh, and, and then after the concert, I got an email saying I couldn't get into your show. And I, and I was just, so I felt, I felt personally, I took that, that felt pretty responsible. Um, and I started thinking more about it and looking into it at that time. And, you know, it's been, it's been a, a, a like a, a, it's something that I think you have to keep working on. It's not something that like comes easy for everybody. Like I was going to do a show, I book a show the other day with a, a partner and play the same venue I always played and always a sold out show, small venue. And I just said, you know, we really should be looking to do the show at an accessible venue and trying to partner with some new initiatives for this one. And, and I didn't get any pushback and they were wonderful. Like we're still looking for the right spot, but you know, just those kinds of things where it's like, it's so easy to say yes to a gig that, you know, will sell out. But I think it's, I think the right thing to do in, in as, as often as you can, like it, it, I still struggle with that. I can't necessarily right now afford to make every single opportunity that comes my way accessible to everybody, but I can do better. You know what I mean? I can keep trying. This is the Major Mixtape Podcast. Our guest today, Christina Martin. We're going to step away for just a quick second. And when we come back, we're going to learn a little bit more about Christina. You've heard it all before. Waste of film. Dumpster fire. How did this even get made? Train rack. Total garbage. Snooze fest. Utterly painful. Worst film ever. But is it really? The show is called It's Not That Bad, and we dare to look at the lowest rated shows and movies and see only the good things. We're looking for A grades and B movies. It's Not That Bad. Listen now, wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to the Made You Mixtape Podcast. Our guest today, Christina Martin. Now, Christina, you mentioned before the break that you had gotten into a few different things during the pandemic to kind of keep things going. And two of them come to mind. The first one is the Global Music Match program that you were involved with. The second one was the Denim Sessions, where you were basically 
for lack of a better term, hosting your own podcast. How did those two initiatives come about and how much did you enjoy being in the host chair as opposed to being in the interview chair like right now? Oh, <laughs> uh, I was, uh, I, I saw the Global Music Match um, initiative, which was the first public Global Music Match um kind of announce or announce that's not the right word. Um, I, I saw the opportunity in an email from the East Coast Music Awards, which is our music association here in, in Atlanta, Canada. And I submitted not really knowing all that much about it, but I knew I was going to be home and I was reaching out for pretty much anything that came my way because, you know, we were pretty hungry for opportunities to, and work. And, um, and so that initiative partnered me with a team of, well, there were five of us from around the world, musicians, and it was really a very, like much a boot camp for, um, for online uh, marketing and, um, but also networking. And we learned how to interview each other and edit our own videos and whatnot, which I loved. I have always wanted to do a podcast of my own and I'm working on that right now. It's not, out yet, but that was, that kind of gave me the confidence. Like I was like, Oh, I really enjoy doing this. And it's so much more fun than talking about yourself, um, asking other people questions. <laughs> and, uh, I really like that. I, I actually secretly wanted to, for uh, many, many years, um, be an interviewer of some kind. Um, but it's not something I ever pursued. Um, so the global music match was really great. And I still, uh, am in touch with, a lot of my teammates and, um, you know, I think the partnerships we made, uh, you know, even during the six weeks of intense kind of, uh, you know, social media marketing and promoting each other's music, uh, goes beyond like, I mean, I'm going to Scot Scotland for a showcase in February and I'll get to hang out with, um, I own a Fife that was on my, that's on my team as she's in Glasgow. And, uh, and I've done a show uh, not related to Global Music Match with Sam Carter, who was on my team. And, you know, I, I, just, I, I like to, you know, it's, it's, these are like long-term friendships and kind of going back to what my Kai, my friend Kai said from Dachau, like international friendships prevent war kind of thing. Um, I just think it's, it's a really cool initiative that's continues uh, today. Thank goodness at Global Music Match. Um, the denim sessions was um, like, we were, we were, we, we hit the ground running. Like when we got back from our canceled tour dates and started live streaming and fumbling our way through like how to do this, how to do this from home where our internet is so terrible and really, um, realized quickly, like I have only so many songs and I, I, I'm bored <laughs> of myself. Like how, so we took a break for a bit and I thought about this uh, with my partner, Dale, um, you know, the denim sessions, I think one at one point I, I, I always wanted to like start a side side band called like denim dream or something. Cause uh, we just have so many jeans in our, and, uh, jean jackets in our closet. And so anyway, we came with, up with like a, a 10 week series. Uh, for, it was on Facebook live called the denim, uh, sessions. And then I had the denim diaries, I believe, which was kind of just me interviewing people on, uh, Instagram live, um, and, uh, gave away prizes. It was just a lot of fun and I could plan it out. It was just once a week, you know, like I like structure and I, I also, it, it kind of took a little bit of pressure off of me to be doing like just a random live stream every, every day, which, you know, I ended up doing 23 more, uh, in the cabin fever series in the winter. Like I did a lot of what I think is not as many, like not as many live streams as some people are doing them like hardcore, like, um, you know, almost every day. I, I couldn't do that. I just, I just get sick of myself and I assume everybody else is sick of me too, but it was really fun. Like, I mean, I met a lot of people, new fans online and people were so supportive. Like, I don't know how I would have gotten by financially without doing the live streaming to be honest. And, um, yeah, so it really helped out. So now that you've done, you know, the, the interview side of things, as far as being a host goes, which do you f feel you had to prepare more for, or prepare more for being a, an interview host or getting ready for a live show? 
I over prepare for both. I, I, uh, which one do I enjoy more? I, I, I would say, you know, I would say I really do enjoy preparing for the interviews um, because I learn so much from other people and then it becomes more of a discussion, like a chat, you know, with the good ones. Um, and sometimes when you're preparing for a show, I mean, I'm, I'm every show I, I try to think of something, a little bit, something fresh to say, or, you know, living in the moment if you're on tour and, um, but it kind of becomes a little more automatic, I suppose. Um, and, you know, if you're doing a longer tour, like it, you don't have to think so much about it, but yeah, I really enjoy the interviewing thing. I always learn something new and as long as I'm not stressed, like, and I have the time to, uh, learn about the person and think up fun questions. Um, then I just really like it. I'm excited. I hope I actually follow through with my podcast plans. Um, it's, you know, it's funny. Sometimes I think I'm more of a project planner than, uh, and I, I dream up all these things. I put all this time into it, but then sometimes pulling the trigger and, and actually delivering it is, is another thing, uh, that, so I hope I actually come through with my podcast, as I said. <laughs> if the opportunity ever arose for, you know, to basically host your own show, whether it be on, yes. ter- whether it be yes, on terrestrial Jason. radio <laughs> or Sirius XM, you know, you know, how I was about to say, how, how fast would you jump at the opportunity? I, I think you already answered that part of it. Uh, it depends really. Like, honestly, if it paid, I would definitely do it because I need money. And <laughs> And if, it, you know, if it would depend on like what the spin on the show, I guess, was. But um, I mean, I'm already planning my own podcast and no one's paying me to do that. So, um, yeah, as long as I could do it from home, I was offer, offered to do a show uh, at a radio station in in, um, in East Coast, in East Coast here a, a couple of years ago. And I I said no, because I I think at the time I thought I would have to go in to do it. Um, but also I. I, uh, I don't know. It wasn't really, I think what I was being pitched to do wasn't really my, my thing. Like I, I have to feel like I'm actually bringing something. I'm excited about this. I have something to bring to the table. Um, it could be fun. And, uh, you know, oftentimes I, I do have to, like, if I'm going to do something, I do have to think it's, is this going to be a source of revenue for me? <laughs> like I'm a businesswoman as well. I like money. I like making money. I need money to keep doing what I'm doing. And, you know, not have to get, uh, sorry, that's my can. You're probably hearing that in your, not a problem. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, this isn't the promotion for thirsty Buddha sprinkler, mm-hmm. uh, sparkling coconut water. Um, yeah. So I think, I think it'd be fun, but the, the timing would have to be right. Maybe the price. <laughs> Let's put a hypothetical out there for you. Okay. Like a you, price. A pr- are you no, going to put no, a price? No, not, not a price. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But, but let's say, You've got your radio show. You are the host. Mm. You have yeah. your choice of first guest in the interview chair for your first episode, no matter who, who's in the chair. Oh, well, I mean, Tom Petty's dead, so I guess it can't be him. I would say, like, maybe, um, although I don't know how we get along, but Jeff Lynn would be great. Um, ooh, like Stevie Nicks. Uh, she would be wonderful. Uh, Chrissy Hind, Annie Lennox would be phenomenal. Cindy Lauper. Um, I mean, if we went through the list of, um, you know, the songs uh, that I sent you for my mixtapes, uh, I could pull any names there. Yeah, but I, I guess I thought Jeff Lynn right off the bat because I don't really, I've never talked to him before. <laughs> and so I, I would have a lot to ask. Um I mean, I have to do some digging, some research, because I mean, there's there's a lot I don't know about him. I just really think he's a wonderful songwriter and performer, and he's probably got a lot of great stories, <laughs> uh, road stories, home stories, hanging out with the Wilburys, and um, and he's just a really great producer. So. One of the things I always like to find out about uh, about someone is there's this moment where you know, obviously, you're young, and for the first time with your own money, you go to the record store and you buy an album for yourself. Not you got one for your birthday or for Christmas. You actually went to the record store, your own earned money, bought a Mm. record for yourself. Do you remember what that first record was? 
Right, and it can't be like Columbia House, right? Everyone has their Columbia House shape, but no, I mean actually physically going to mm-hmm. the record store. It's like, well, it's the twelfth cassette. Yeah. I think I'll guess I'll get that one. No, uh, actually physically well, going to the record store. <laughs> yeah, you know the the my first memory of going to a record store in my where I lived in Grand Falls, New Brunswick. Um, was actually to order something for my dad's birthday. So my dad was a big fan of Roy Orbison, but I wasn't, you know, I didn't know like what his albums were. I didn't really even know much about Roy Orbison. I knew, I knew I'd heard him sing and I, you know, I really liked his voice too. And, and my dad really liked this song called Blue Bayou. And so I went and asked, they didn't have any Roy Orbison. And so I asked if they could order some. And I remember the guy making me feel really embarrassed that I had asked for Roy Orbison. And I don't know, I don't know why, I don't know what he said. I just remember feeling really embarrassed. Like it was not cool for ordering Roy Orbison. It was like a greatest hits cassette tape probably at that time. And anyway, but they ordered it in and then I, you know, wrapped it up and gave it to my dad for his birthday. He probably already had, because my dad had like thousands of records. So he probably already had it in his record collection, but at that time I wasn't, I wasn't really into like hardcore into records. Like I was just like, okay, cassette tapes, you know, and I had a few and not, I didn't have a crazy collection. I just kind of listened to the same stuff all the time. Um, yeah. So, but the Roy Orbison, that's my first memory of God. It wasn't even for me, but it, it you know, what it was, was for my father. Yeah. What were those early listens for you in your, in your cassette collection and how much did those, you know, those early cassettes that you owned, you know, basically you know, influence your early writing days. I don't think they, inf- I don't know if they influenced my early writing days. Um, I shouldn't say that. I think, um, I mean, there are different phases of my life. Like, I mean, I was, I was extremely into Brian Adams and <laughs> like Canadian content, like Jan Arden, um, you know, I was listening to what was popular on the radio, um, what, what I was seeing on music videos, you know, so it was like this kind of slow, slow evolution for me. Um, I didn't really, I mean, the music, I suppose artists like uh, probably Brian Adams and Jan Arden, um, Elena Miles, you know, they probably did have an influence on my songwriting maybe, but when I started songwriting was when I moved to Austin, Texas. And at that time, that is when I started listening to like singer songwriters like Sean Colvin, Patty Griffin, um, in sort of a roundabout way, Paul Westerberg and uh, Tori Amos. I remember being very, so I really think that those Tori Amos was really big influence. Um, You know, Sean Colvin, Towns Van Zandt, like, and these, singer songwriters like and really a lot of stripped down stuff that was probably influencing me at that time at that you know and continued to um and i and i really don't i mean i like all kinds of music but i i really don't listen to a lot of um you know i'll get locked into something so for periods i mean tom petty and the heartbreakers were you know huge influence for me and bruce springsteen for a while and david bowie um, and Tina, you know, like the, it wasn't, so it wasn't always also the song writing. It was the performer like Tina Turner, um, was the vocals, the delivery, you know? Yeah. So I don't know if I answered your question, but. Well, it does lead us to, you know, the penultimate question of the podcast. So if you, Christina mm-hmm. Martin had to introduce yourself to a total stranger, but instead of saying, hi, I'm Christina, you hand them a mixtape. And on that tape are songs that tell the story of you. What songs are on that tape and why are those songs there? Okay, so my first one I I, I picked, for my first song, I picked Tina Turner, uh, Simply the Best. Because I just think it's a great song. But um, I Tina Turner is an artist that I think still to this day, I look up to as an icon. And my father brought us to see the what's love got to do with it story of her life in uh, Montreal in uh, 1993. And then immediately after the movie was done, we, 
we went to her concert that night. And so I walked out of that. I was transformed in that concert. I mean, as soon as she took the stage and, you know, I, I was a fan of Tina Turner. So uh, I, that was one artist that I walked into and like listened to my father's records and watched her music videos growing up. And I'm, I just remember my, I mean, I stood up and started screaming (laughs) and singing along. It was just incredible. And I remember walking away from the concert, like leaving the stadium, just thinking I, if, how could I, like, if I could be in a band like that, I, that's what I want to do, but I had no idea how I would ever achieve that. And later on when I moved to Austin, Texas, and I remember walking down six, six street and just kind of wandering into different bars. And, and one night I went into a bar and there wasn't many people there at all, but there was this really great, um, R and B like a mix of R and B and like just really cool seventies kind of rock and this re- really strong female lead singer, uh, just belting things and and I belting the songs and I just remember thinking like I want to do that you know and and I and I had opportunities where I was you know I was in a seventies rock revival band as a backup singer and and a dancer and played tambourine in Austin and. And then I got kicked out and I started doing my own stuff and like, but yeah, it was just, um, I think Tina for, for whatever reason made me think that maybe that was something I could uh, do. It made me want to do that because she just seemed so liberated and, and empowered and strong. And that's what I, that's how I wanted to feel, you know, and that seemed like the stage was a place for her to, to, you know, present that, side of herself and and uh and it was really powerful so it was pretty cool and um I, I also picked Whitney Houston because I grew up you know singing along to Whitney Houston and just another one of the world's greatest singers and um, and the song I will always love you I mean it it makes me cry every time I listen to it Dolly Dolly wrote the song but it's just such an incredible song and uh and performance um, my third pick was Sean Colvin, a song called Even Here We Are. Um, I don't know if I ever would have come across Paul Westerberg's music, um, or, you know, fall in love with him as a songwriter, um, had it not first for, been for, uh, this encounter with Sean Colvin. So I, I moved in 1999 to Austin, Texas. I left university. I quit. I was not doing very well in school at that time. My father had just died and I, it was kind of like this whole, I can do whatever I want now, you know, like I need to figure out what that is. And, and I moved to Austin and my host father uh, who I was living with and working with, he handed me a cassette tape and one of the singer songwriters on there was Sean doing a live rendition of even here we are. And I, just loved the song and it was one of the one of those songs that i you know first tried to learn how to play on guitar when i bought mine soon i think it was that summer after i moved to austin that i bought a guitar and started putting my journaling you know into songs um so i also didn't really know sean colvin uh her music before that and fell in love with it and her, she, there were a couple of songs like, you know, her, her Bob Dylan cover, You're Gonna Make Me Lonesome. Uh, again, I wouldn't have, like, I wouldn't have listened to it had I heard Bob singing it. <laughs> I just, it, she just did, did such a beautiful rendition and I and I learned that and started playing that at open mic nights a, a year later once I finally learned how to play guitar and I taught myself and um, had gone to Germany to be an au pair and came back to Austin. And so I was then determined to start playing open mic nights and, and just getting out there. And, and so I would have been playing, you're going to make me lonesome, uh, this Bob Dylan song that I didn't even know Bob Dylan wrote it. I really thought it was a Sean Colvin song. And, and even here we are by Paul Westerberg. Again, I would thought Sean wrote that song, but I loved all of her songs as well. Um, and got to, you know, see a meet her and hear her perform at Waterloo Records in Austin and get her autograph. And, and that was really cool. Um, uh, yeah, moving on to Patty Griffin, who I also discovered in 
Austin, my producer who produced my first album, Pretty Things, and was my guitar player at the time. He took me to a wedding, a friend of his, and I was sitting at the table with this great gal uh, from Maine originally. And so I grew up in New Brunswick. And so we started talking about our connection between Maine and New Brunswick. And at one point I just said, what's your name again? And my producer sat next to me and he, he elbowed me and said, put your foot in your mouth. That's Patty Griffin. And so here I was talking with this incredible artist. I had no idea. I just loved her uh, personality. We really clicked. And uh, and that was really neat. Uh, so I, I actually started listening to her music. I had been told about her and that I should listen to her music and could learn something, you know. Um, but I, I only started listening after I had met her. And uh, that was really neat. So I, I, I picked uh, When It Don't Come Easy from her album, The Impossible Dream. So I was listening to especially her first um, three albums quite a bit at that time in my life. And no doubt, you know, she was an influence on my songwriting and, and singing uh, so much that my producer at that time said, you need to stop doing covers of other females because you run the risk of not developing like your own unique style um, and just imitating them. Because I mean, that is um, how I learned to sing was just imitating other artists. And, um, and I had an ear for that. So uh, yeah, no more, no, unfortunately, no more Sean Coleman, no more Patty Griffin covers at my shows, uh, for, for, well, for a very long time. <laughs> um, I picked Tori Amos because I love her music, saw her in concert in San Antonio. I picked Baker Baker, which is from Under the Pink. Um, it's just a song that when I used to, um, babysit for extra money on the weekends, um, in Austin, I remember I would spend my nights when the kids were asleep. Um, I would spend my nights reading, writing, and trying to write, like work on songs. And this is one, but I would listen to music to get me in the mode, in the mood. And I, I listened to that song just obsessively, really. It's just a beautiful, beautiful song. And I had no idea what she was writing about. Um, I just really loved her voice and how she used it. I suppose she's probably an influence of hers was Kate Bush and I did not and still don't listen really a lot to Kate Bush, but I, I've, I've now listened to a little bit of it, but people have sometimes made the comparison for what I do to Kate Bush. But I think it comes from my love of Tori Amos and really listening to a lot of Tori Amos and that Kate Bush, most likely it was a big influence on, on Tori. Okay. All right. We're at number <laughs> six. We're at hard times hit by an artist named Sila who's my pen pal. Uh, Sila lives in Austin, Texas. And so I would go out to hear Sila perform live at, um, at the clubs, at the cafes in Austin. I looked up to her and she was one of these artists locally at the time that I, I just loved what she was doing and her style of, you know, sort of confessional songwriting and, it, it, it kind of made me feel like maybe I could do that thing. Maybe. Um, she, she just was really inspiring and is really cool. And, uh, okay, number seven, The Pretenders, I'll Stand By You. Um, I picked this one, I guess, because I've always loved The Pretenders, um, Chrissy Hind, and I love how she uses her vocals. And that song was actually one that I used as sort of like a, Oh, I would like my impossible to hold song to be like that kind of a rock song, like that ballad. And so I think it was, and it, it definitely influenced that title track um, that uh, from the impossible to hold album in, that I put out in 2018. Um, number eight, I picked Cindy Lauper, another female artist that has hugely influenced me. Um, I love her songs. I love her delivery. I think she's just a unique force. And I picked Shine. Um, I just really love the pop production, but she also kind of incorporates a lot of organic sounds uh, and instrumentation in a lot of her pop production. And um, yeah, and, and uh, I just think she's a powerhouse. So I'm not always good at explaining why I love like music or what I love about a certain artist, but uh, it's just somebody who I've followed and continue to follow and her, her and my next artist I selected, um, I, well, I picked the song loneliness from uh, the bear album. 
uh, by Annie Lennox. Um, artists like Cindy Lauper, Annie Lennox, like they aren't just, you know, they don't just have like these sort of lifelong, incredible musical careers, but they're actually out there doing like humanitarian work and, um, you know, advocating for what they think is important and really using their platform in a, in a wonderful way, in a very powerful way. Um, so I, I kind of keep an eye on that stuff. And I mean, I, 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 it's, it's like, it's something you can, I think you can always try to aspire to, like you might, you might not uh, have that level of influence, you know, but I mean, it's when I think if you think about, you know, building a celebrity or fame or building your brand, um, for me, if I have the chance to do that and, and, you know, become more popular, it, it, it's so that you can have that platform to spread more joy and do more good. I think like artists like Cindy and Annie have done, uh, continue to do. Or right, same with Buffy St. Marie. Um, I picked, uh, uh, you got to run from the album, a spirit of the wind. And, uh, I just really love the song. I didn't grow up listening to Buffy's music. Um, oh, sorry. It's from the album Medicine Songs. Um, yeah, and I, I started listening more to Buffy a couple of years ago and just realized the power in her uh, songwriting and performing. And um, yeah, I just, I, I, I wonder why we didn't have more Buffy St. Marie in the house growing up. Um because she's been a huge influence and certainly carved, I think, a lot of pathways for women in music. So that's a great one to check out too. Hey, that's it. I just plowed through <laughs> 10. And I picked all female because I, I mean, there's, I, I, um, I really thought it was hard to pick. It's hard to pick a mixed tape. And I thought, why not uh, really showcase like just, like think about the women who have really impacted me. me. Um, there are lots of men uh, as well, but I just thought this was a great opportunity to talk about the ladies. As Stay With Me gets out there and people start to, to take it in, what's the takeaway that you hope people get when they listen to the new music? Oh, I have no idea. What is the takeaway? Um, I mean, I, I mean, I, if I just hope, I, I would just hope that it, it's nice if like the music you make and put out, like, you know, affects people in some way, makes them feel something. I don't know what that is for like, I mean, my mother-in-law thinks the song is, is about one particular thing. And, uh, it, you know, everyone, I think everyone's going to take what they want or need from the song. Um, I just hope it makes people feel something, but I, I don't, I hesitate to say what, you know, or specifically, uh, yeah. Uh, I just hope it makes people resonate in some way and that's it. Maybe. Yeah. As people hear music, you know, they obviously take their own meaning out of the song as they listen to it. Have you ever had that moment where someone has come up to you or messaged you and said, I, you know, thank you for this song because it it helped me through this, or thank you for this lyric because it hit it hit really hard here. Yeah, um, most of the time people are pretty vague, like they just say or private, I suppose. Um, you know, thanks, you know, for that record. It that record got me through this period of my life, or this song. You know, we were going, me and my partner were going through a rough time and this song really helped, helped us, you know, or helped me. Um, so, I mean, and certainly when I did the uh, songs relating to dementia, there were a number of people that I met that those songs resonated with because either, well, m most of the cases it was their, they were a care, a caregiver um, looking after somebody in their family. So it was just nice to know that they weren't alone and somebody was kind of thinking about their situation, you know, or trying, trying to put, put themselves in, in, in their situation. Um, yeah. So sometimes that does happen. Um, and I guess that's cool. 
you've got the shows coming up in the Maritimes through November, and I know you have a couple slated for the Netherlands uh, in 2022. But what's next after after those shows? What's next for you? Oh gosh, yeah. Well, I mean, like we've got over 30 shows. I just haven't posted them in Europe, in G- mainly Germany and um, Austria, Netherlands. Um, so that's going to be keeping us pretty busy for the winter and the spring. Uh, and then it's, I, I'm really just planning for slow releasing the new music and launching the album. And, you know, I hope to be able to put a, together a show, like a release show and maybe do some tour dates that, um, you know, kind of properly represent the album. I uh, hope to do some shows that are, uh, you know, kind of more inclusive and, and, um, kind of welcoming to way more people. Um, so that's the kind of stuff we're working on uh, here every week, uh, working towards, but it takes, it takes a while <laughs> to, <laughs> and to get the resources together. But yeah, I mean, I'll be hopefully promoting this album and these songs for the next few years. And it's really, really stretching it out, just squeezing the juice out of them and uh, taking our time, you know, Christina, thank you so much for this. Much success on the tour. Much success on the on the new music. Where can we find you out there, and where can we hear the new song "Stay with Me"? Oh, thanks, Jason. Um, well, you can find everything about me on my website, christinamartin.net. Um, you find me on Patreon. Support me there. Um, and the "Stay with Me" is um, you can really just go to my website. That's the easiest. <laughs> <laughs> it's on Spotify. It's on all the places. Uh, it's on Bandcamp. But you can get to everything from my website, ChristinaMartin.net. Christina, thank you so much for this. And to my listeners, thank you for listening to this episode of the Major Mixtape Podcast. Now, if you're listening to us on an audio streaming service, you can watch this entire interview over on YouTube. But if you're watching us on YouTube right now, you can head on over, download the episode, and listen to us anywhere on the go, wherever you get your podcast. This is the Major Mixtape Podcast. I'm your host, Jason. Until next time, take care. Mm-hmm.